And what we do in genetic engineering uh, is to confer new capabilities in an organism, on an organism that it didn't have, and create an environment within it so that those capabilities are converted into abilities. So your uh, common bacteria, Mesherishe coli, uh, causes colitis, cannot make human insulin. So we can put the gene for human insulin into Mesherishe coli, see that this uh, gene is then expressed in it to make human insulin, and that the bacteria, when it divides, carries this gene so that the gene is integrated into the genome of the recipient uh, bacteria. So that's what genetic engineering is, uh, uh, is about. And let's not forget that um, today three of the most highly selling drugs which have saved the lives of millions of people are made through genetic engineering, including human insulin, which simply wasn't available 15 years ago. So uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with the technology per se. Just like nuclear technology, you can use it to make atom bombs, you can also use it to make radioactive isotopes, which you use for medical research. Uh, so, um, let's be quite clear that the technology is a very powerful technology and there's basically nothing wrong with the technology per se uh, and as being very widely used, we like it to be more widely used to make drugs which otherwise are ext extremely expensive or simply not available. But when uh, you use this technology to um, make genetically engineered plants for human consumption, or for other purposes, I think the game is very different. Uh, please remember that when I'm using a genetically engineered organism to make drugs, this is done in a confined area in a factory. If the drug doesn't work for some reason, you close the factory, destroy the organism, that's the end of it. But once you release a plant in the environment, there's no way that you can recall it. In, in, in innumerable instances around the world, in our country, there was no water hyacinth before 1958. And uh, now water hyacinth has choked a lot, lot of our waterways, our lakes, and so on. And we will spend literally um, maybe 20,000 crores, and one crore is 10 million in the country on trying to deal with this problem. Another is parthenium, which probably came with the PL480 wheat in the 1960s, and it's called Congress grass, and it, is, it leads to allergy. A large number of people have suffered from allergy. And same is true of Australia. You know the story of rabbits in Australia. So once you get them and release them in the environment, you cannot recall them. And therefore you have to be extremely careful before you decide to release a genetically modified plant or animal or anything living in the environment. Now, clearly there are advantages. For example, the most common gene that has been used and transferred into a large number of plants is the Bt gene, which is derived from a bacterium. It's a toxin and uh, acts against a whole range of pests. So when you put that gene in, let's say, cotton or in a vegetable, uh, the, uh, that particular plant which carries this gene now becomes resistant to the pest for which, against which it is designed. So that's the advantage. That's the advantage is due to the presence of that particular gene. But uh, then there are many disadvantages. One is the gene itself. For example, I'm putting in a toxin gene. The toxin could, of course, prevent the plant by uh, uh, attacked by pests, but the toxin can also affect other living organisms. So there's a, there could be a problem on account of the toxin itself. Then uh, perhaps the most important matter of concern is the unintended effects. When you put in a gene, a transgene, and this is a very well-known, very well-established phenomena in biology, that when you put in a foreign gene, part of the gene, 10 to 15 percent, actually gets fragmented. And these fragments can go and insert themselves into the genome of the host anywhere and everywhere. And we don't know where they go. So they can actually stop the functioning of a useful gene or create a new gene which makes a new product which can be toxic or harmful in many other ways. So that's what we call unintended effects and we have a very large number of examples of this. Then there's a problem of uh, what we call the vector. A vector is really the, car the, the carrier of this gene. Uh, and very often we use a viral vector. Now we have to use a marker so that we can then identify which of the plants have been transformed, because not every plant gets transformed uh, when we put in this gene. Uh, and very often they use a, ma use a uh, 
antibiotic resistance marker. Now, if you use antibiotic resistance marker, then if this gene gets transferred to an animal, to another bacteria, then that bacteria becomes resistant to the drug. So we have this problem of antibiotic markers. For example, in Bt Brinjol, they put in two antibiotic resistant markers. One was resistance against canamycin, they, which, is a, which is a rarely used drug, perhaps not such a problem. But the other was an, was an, a, a marker uh, which was a streptomycin resistance marker. But a streptomycin is used today. And therefore, that's a problem. One of the reasons why uh, Bt Brinjol was not approved was because it had this AAD gene marker. So that's a problem with the vector. Then uh, there are social problems. For example, uh, besides the Bt gene, the most commonly gene, used gene that is used for transformation, genetic engineering, is the VD side gene. Uh, so that you can use large amount of VD side and the, the plant will not die, but the weeds will die. We don't have this gene. Uh, the Roundup Ready, made by Monsanto. Uh, now in India, actually weeds are not a problem because the manual labor is used to actually take care of weeds and these weeds are used as, as manure. So there's a social problem. Now this doesn't happen in the United States, but it happens in India. So there are these social problems that we have to worry about. Then the question is that do we need it? Now in the case of cotton, yes, there was a problem. There was a problem that uh, this uh, infestation by ballworm was there and we needed something to prevent that. And the largest amount of pesticide used in our country uh, was on cotton. Uh, so we needed a mechanism to prevent this pest infestation uh, in cotton. Uh, and genetic engineering was one of these mechanisms that was used. But in the case of brinjol, we didn't have this problem. The total loss on account of pest infestation in brinjol was less than 10%. And even this uh, brinjol that was affected by these fruit and shoot borer, which is an insect, affects brinjol, uh, was used by, these, uh, uh, by the farmers to feed to cattle. So there was really no need for Bt brinjol, and, and brinjol is the cheapest vegetable in India, available around the, around the year, available everywhere. It's a poor man's vegetable. So we, we did not really need, uh, so there was really no social need. And then this question of confined effectiveness. For example, Bt cotton, which is the only genetically modified crop approved in India, uh, it now turns out, we have, to have it, had it for 10 years, that it has worked in uh, irrigated areas. But it hasn't worked in rain-fed non-irrigated areas, which represent two-thirds of the area under cotton in the country. So this is confined effectiveness that also we have to worry. So these are some of the disadvantages that uh, we cannot ignore. Now just to, um, to give you the scope of this, uh, of this technology as of today, uh, the crops that have been genetically engineered by and large, uh, largest extent, are corn, soya, these are the two major ones, then the minor ones are potato, rice, tomato, brinjal, and the non-food crop is of course cotton. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not counting the very minor ones. The genes that have been used uh, is the Bt gene, which is a toxin gene derived from Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, which is, uh, acts against a large number of pests, and Roundup Ready is the Bt side, and both are really the uh, intellectual property rights of uh, come under the IPR of Monsanto. Uh, and the animals in which studies have been done are mice, rats, rabbits, hamsters, chicken, cattle, and humans. So I will present to you the data on, uh, uh, on animals and on humans uh, separately. Uh, so effects on animal health. Now, I, um, every statement that I'm making here is supported by references. And these are, refer these are papers published in highly reputed journals with high impact factor like nature or science by scientists who have no conflict of interest and who work in, most of them work in outstanding institutions like let's say King's College London or the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in La Jolla. Uh, so uh, every statement here is supported by such publications. Uh, we have structural and functional changes in organs which have been documented. Uh, thymus, uh, which is concerned with the immune response, spleen, uh, gastrointestinal tract, liver, pancreas, uh, in pancreas, for example, this drop in amylase production, which is an enzyme which digests carbohydrates, 
very very important uh, testicles there's drop in sertoli cells uh, which uh, from which your sperm are derived and the spermatocytes which intermediate state uh, from sertoli cells to the mature spermatozoa then there are changes in concentration of metabolites and nutrients you know all your proteins the nucleic acids your fats are made from these metabolites and nutrients uh, for example creatinine i'm sure all of you know creatinine because uh, you we use it as a marker for liver function uh, and blood sugar so there are changes in concentration of creatinine and blood sh blood sugar uh, change in key enzyme concentrations like lactic dehydrogenase uh, isozyme 2 uh, which is again a very, very key enzyme involved in glucose metabolism then there's distortion in lipid and carbohydrate metabolism uh, there's disruption of normal growth for example liver kidney uh, formation of blood cells erythropoiesis uh, accelerated aging there's formation of precancerous lesions and development of tumors uh, this development of tumors i think is extremely important there's a very recent paper by seralini from university of khan in france uh, which for the first time did what we call long term toxicity uh, chronic toxicity of gm crops so he felt for the first time it's never been done and although we have been saying this for the last 15 years that such long term study should have been done this is the first really long term study with appropriate controls that was done and he showed that uh, uh, that in uh, his frog deli rats which were used by monsanto for short term studies uh, feeding uh, genetically modified corn uh, led to a very high incidence of tumors which was very very much higher statistically very significant when compared to the control which were fed a non gm non genetically modified diet in, in my state of andhra pradesh in several districts uh, they have been over over a period of 3 years several thousand cattle dying uh, after they foraged on the cotton plant bt cotton plant after the cotton was harvested uh, and there's every reason to believe that these deaths were caused on account of the fact that the bt cotton plant itself contained toxin which normal cotton plant does not contain then there's a reproductive interference this was done by an austrian group uh, supported by the government and you have this problem even continue up to the third generation so low size and birth weight of litter decreased survival and loss of fertility so this is what we have as evidence uh, on the effect of uh, gm crops uh, on 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 animals uh, now on effect on human health uh, you know that it's very difficult to do studies on human health so these are really derivatives based on you know in the inferences that you draw based on the evidence that you have uh, the enormous number of cases of allergy for example in philippines and dano four villages uh, the bt corn pollen iga antibodies are essentially antibodies uh, which are uh, involved in the in the allergenic response uh, so the uh, iga antibodies igm I, uh, igg and igm antibodies were found in which are specific for bt corn genetically engineered corn found in 39 out of 100 people with dizziness stomach pain vomiting fever uh, this is a established case in the case of punjab we have a very large number of people suffering from allergy uh, when they have been working in the in farms which grow bt cotton unfortunately we have not been able to send the samples of blood out out of the country because we do have no facility to test for i think one can say this with a reasonable confidence that at least one subset of these people suffering from allergy must be on account of uh, their working in bt cotton fields then in the united states of america uh, between 90 1997 and 1999 two thirds of the processed food had genetically modified material and food allergy in children up 18% between this period uh, now i think this doesn't by any means establish that this increase is on account of gm material but i think it makes it probable and the fact that anaphylaxis cases from food in, from from food in the united states increased from 21000 to 51000 again during the period that gm food has been used in the uh, united states points to the same conclusion that this could very well be a consequence of the use of gm food then food allergy related hospital admissions 
in the United States increased from 2,600 per year during this period that uh, GM food wa was not used to 9,500 year, per year during the period that, that GM food was started, had begun to be used in the United States. Again, in the United States, before 99, before the GM food was used, 10% were allergic to soya. After 1999, when GM soya came, 50% have become allergic to soya. So there, I think there is a great deal of evidence, circumstantial evidence, which suggests that uh, there's severe, serious allergy problem with, uh, with GM crops, uh, even as far as humans are concerned. Then uh, uh, we have in Punjab uh, very high incidence of cancer. In fact, there are cancer trains that go from these small places to the larger cities in Punjab, in districts where GM, uh, BT, uh, where BT cotton, genetically modified cotton has been used. And uh, in one of the districts of Argentina, La Yonasa, the childhood cancer rate has tripled between 2000 and 2009. That's the period during which they have used uh, uh, GM corn, GM soya, and GM rice. Uh, then again in Leona, uh, Leonasa, there's fourfold increase in birth defects during this period of uh, use of uh, extensive use of, of GM food. Now, in the case of the United States, uh, it's very interesting that is, uh, we have attempted to plot the increase in the incidence of gastrointestinal disorders in the United States uh, during the last 15 years. Uh, and it's very interesting that this plot actually overlaps the plot <coughs> of increase in consumption of GM food in the United States. Now, this bargain by no means establishes a cause and effect relationship, but it makes it likely, it makes it possible. And it'll take a long, long time to actually establish this because in the United States, GM food is not labeled. Now, there are cases, please remember that how long it took for us to establish that cancer is caused by smoking, or smoking causes cancer, over 100 years. In our country, we have a case in Madhya Pradesh uh, where uh, till, na till 1960, there, was a, uh, there were large incidents, uh, instances of lethrism, a disease which leads to bow legs, and it's like you know, symptoms of osteo osteoarthritis. And it took more than a, the disease has been recorded, the British record, of the, in the 18th and 19th century. It took close to 200 years to find the cause for this disease. And that was a, a, a pulse uh, which was used to contaminate Turdal, it's called um, Lethra uh, sativus. Was the common name for it is Kesri Dal. I think many of you probably know that, Kesri Dal. And of course, once that Kesri Dal was removed, the disease disappeared. Today, nobody knows. There's no incidence of, of this disease anywhere in the country. So uh, it, may, it may take a long time to establish uh, that the GM food could be a cause of these increased uh, GI disorders, inclu including obesity in the United States. Uh, you know, the simple experiments, well, we have, there are four or five genes that control obesity. Most predominant of them is, that, is uh, the gene for the protein called leptin. Why haven't they studied just the effect of, uh, of the Bt gene, Bt gene product, the Bt toxin, on leptin? Or the products of these five genes that are involved in regulation of obesity. So even these experiments, simple experiments, have not been done. And my feeling is they've not been done because they're scared that if the experiments are done, they turn out to be positive. So that is the situation that we have today with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, you know, uh, with the uh, human system. Then on plants, there's a very, very fine and very interesting paper just published, well, not just, about a year ago, uh, by a group of Indian scientists from the University of Delhi. Uh, Pradeep Burma, I know him extremely well. I was, I've known him since I was a child very fine scientist, his father was a very, old, very well known bio, bio, biochemist in the country. And uh, in this paper he has shown that when you put in the Bt gene in cotton plant or in, in brinjal or eggplant, uh, it leads to uh, uh, effect on growth and development. The growth and development are badly affected by this presence of this gene. Now see what is happening in the field is that uh, uh, you, they do these strip trials. So they have a large number of plants which have been transformed, and each plant is different from the other. And so they select for a plant which gives you the resistance to the pest. 
but they don't determine whether this has a toxin in it. So what probably is happening is that since they select, uh, they're only interested in the cotton that comes out of the plant, they're not interested in the plant itself. So this really has, uh, has escaped the notice of people till now. But it can be a disaster in the country, in a country like ours, where the remnants of the cotton plant, after cotton is harvested, are actually fed to, the, fed to cattle. So cattle forage on this plant. So this is a very serious problem that we have in our country. Then effect on agriculture in uh, India. You know, the BT cotton story, we, we have been, BT cotton has been around in India for 10 years. Uh, there are, they initially there was a success, but subsequently the yields came down and uh, now they actually have fallen down, which people don't quite uh, don't realize. This is in addition to what I said that these yields have increased only in the rain, in the irrigated areas and not in the rain fed areas. Now to make a long story short, uh, it turns out that in years that there was increased yields, the pest infestation was low uh, and that uh, the, the control that was used was not an isogenic hybrid without the BTG. So now you can calculate what are the likely chances, what, what is the likely contribution of the BTG, it turns out not more than 3 to 4 percent, unlike what is claimed by the industry. Uh, so uh, then there was a the development of resistance uh, to the BT gene in, uh, in Gujarat and in Punjab. In Punjab, we had minor pests come up, like mealy bug. Uh, apparently, some beneficial pests, uh, you know, their density has gone down. There's effect on soil ecology. So Gujarat farmers say, uh, that's where BT cotton has been used to the largest extent, that the soil has become incapable of sustaining any other crop. And uh, there is a problem of contamination of small farms uh, with growing organic uh, cotton, for example, or, or organic food, uh, and we have no liability laws to take care of their interest. Uh, so uh, now, as far as the environment biodiversity is concerned, today it's strange that we have no non-BT cotton available in India. It's just gone out to the market. So it's, it's kind of monoculture that we are really doing, and that uh, obviously is undesirable if you want to maintain our biodiversity. Then there's contamination of centers of origin, you know, this is what happens in Mexico. Uh, interference with natural evolution uh, when we uh, have these Bt crops around. Uh, there are related effects, uh, antibiotic resistance I mentioned to you. A gene can be transferred, this uh, uh, Bt gene can be transferred to GI tract bacteria. The genetically modified DNA coding for the Bt gene uh, is known to appear in the blood of, the, uh, of animals. And lateral gene transfer can occur to completely unrelated plants. Uh, pollen can travel about uh, even 100 miles in 48 hours, the insects that can do that. Uh, now the Indian situation, and that's the last but one slide, uh, is that, that the initial entry in use of BT cotton was illegal. I have documentation to that effect. Anyone who would like to see this, I will be very happy to show you documentation that this was completely illegal. Uh, there's a conflict of interest in the two committees that are responsible for uh, for giving permission for the use or open release of, of uh, genetically modified uh, uh, products. Uh, then there's a Supreme Court ruling that uh, to make BT uh, data public, which wasn't made public in the initial, initial years. Uh, BT Brinjal's story, you know, all of you know very well, uh, that a moratorium has been put, uh, indefinite moratorium on release of BT Brinjal. Many states in the country have said they will not allow any field trials of GM food. The parliament, the standing parliamentary committee uh, on agriculture, which was asked to give its opinion on GM crops, has very clearly said no to GM crop for the time being and no field trials to be conducted. And the technical uh, expert committee appointed by the Supreme Court has also given the same kind of, of, of judgment. So in India, I think as of today, uh, the opinion is the, the professional opinion where there's no conflict of interest is really very much against the GM crops uh, as, of, as of now. Uh, now, the last point I want to make is that, uh, please uh, don't forget that India is primarily an agriculture country. That 70% uh, of Indians live in villages, 64% of Indians derive their total sustenance from agriculture or agriculture-related activities. Uh, 84% of these farmers are small farmers or marginal farmers. Small farmers having less than four hectares of land and marginal farmers having less than two hectares of land. 
Uh, therefore, if you want to control the destiny of India, all that you need to do is to control Indian agriculture. So then you control that 70% of the population. And to do that, all that you need to do is to control seed production and agrochemicals production. And I mentioned that 10 companies control 90% of seed production around the world, excepting part of India and part of China. We are the only exceptions to this rule. Uh, so uh, that is the effort. Um, let's not fool ourselves. The effort is to control India by controlling agriculture through seeds and through agrochemicals. Same companies that market seeds also market agrochemicals. These 10 companies like Monsanto. So that I think is a, is a strategy that is being used. That is a planned strategy as far as we know from all the sources that we have is to use agriculture to control the destiny of our, of our country. Uh, internationally, uh, we have IASTD report with Hans Seren, who is the co-chairman, member of National Academy of Sciences, winner of the Food Prize. And this report is in consonance with the report of our parliamentary committee. And the reports of a large number of scientists who make the same point that I have made. And it's very unfortunate, but I think in some ways, very revealing that Proposition 37, which came up for, for voting in the state of California on the 6th of November, the day of presidential election, uh, the, the proposition said that we would like all GM food to be labeled in California. The proposition is lost, but the important point is 48% people voted for and 52% voted against. And in the last 60 days, $60 million has been spent by these companies in trying to convince people to vote against the proposition. And by saying all kinds of, making all kinds of statements like the price of food will go up, the quality of food will come down, and so on. But people who voted for proposition didn't even spend a million dollars. So it shows the power of money, what money can do in the environment today. And it shows also the lack of education. But I think the fact that 48% people still voted for Proposition 37, I think is very encouraging. So ladies and gentlemen, I think the message is that uh, uh, genetically modified food is a technique that is being used to acquire control over food business. And whosoever controls food business controls the world today. Because food business is the biggest business in the world. And controlling Indian food business, of course, or Chinese food business, I think is uh, is, uh, is the key to controlling the wild food business. China is very much cleverer than us. So there, that all genetic engineering is really very carefully washed by the government. They give up when things don't work. In our country, there's a nexus between multinational corporations, our bureaucrats, our politicians, and, and the governments of countries like the United States. That nexus is very clear. Thank you very much.